Have you ever wondered why we we're so skinny back in 1960? Well, I'm gonna show you how drastic our weight differences have actually become and the three biggest things that have contributed to our obesity problem over the last 65 years. So to kick things off, what did we actually weigh back in 1960? Because the difference is remarkable. Now, back then the average American man weighed about 166 pounds and the average American woman weighed about 140 pounds, but today, the average American man weighs 200 pounds and the average American woman weighs 171 pounds. So that's just so many things. It's crazy, it's shocking, and it's actually kind of disappointing. But what actually happened? How did we manage to gain over 30 pounds on average in the last 65 years? Well, it actually starts with our food. So back then in the 1960s, our dietary recommendations were to follow what was called the basic four, which was to eat meat, dairy, fruits and veggies, and then also grains. Sounds pretty simple, right? But when it comes to our food today, something just isn't right. And there's actually a lot going on, but there's one obvious food ingredient that kind of outshines the rest and it's actually not sugar. Now, by the late 1960s and early 70s, there was a significant effort to prevent chronic illnesses, particularly heart disease, and emerging science determined that the food that we've been eating for hundreds of thousands of years, red meat, saturated fat, and cholesterol, were now killing us, and because of this new science, we saw major shifts in our food. Now, since the goal was to reduce consumption of saturated fats like butter, beef, and eggs, it made perfect sense to start mass producing foods that contained more polyunsaturated fats that are also low in saturated fats and cholesterol. And seed oils, well, they checked all the boxes, but one in particular set the standard, soybean oil. Now, soybean oil is about 61% polyunsaturated fat, 24% monounsaturated fat, and 15% saturated fat. Not only that, but it has zero milligrams of cholesterol. It's nearly flavorless and has a high smoke point, making it extremely versatile. It's also unbelievably cheap to make because the government has been incentivizing farmers through subsidies to mass produce it, and soybean oil now accounts for about 90% of seed oil production in the entire United States. I mean, check out this chart right here that shows seed oil production over the last 75 years. Soybean oil production just took off like a rocket in 1967. And because of how affordable this oil was, along with the fact that it's low in saturated fat, food companies made the business decision to put this cheap factory made oil in nearly all of their products. I mean, honestly, why wouldn't they? They had every reason to do it. No cholesterol, low in saturated fat, and they're cheap. I mean, kind of seems like a huge win and a no brainer for big food. Now, this shift away from animal fats to seed oils ultimately contributed to the explosion of ultra processed foods that could erroneously be labeled as healthy. So this was the beginning of our ultra processed food experiment that's currently peaking today. But it actually gets kind of crazy because there's a big and weird coincidence with this increase in seed oil consumption and the composition of our fatty tissue in our bodies. And there's a scientific paper from 2008 that lays it all out for us. But before we go over that paper, you need to understand some really important things about seed oils like soybean oil. So check out this chart. It's a comparison of fats and oils along with linoleic acid content in each type of fat. Now, as you can see, seed oils contain a high percentage of a fatty acid called linoleic acid. And when linoleic acid breaks down, those molecules are highly inflammatory and do a lot of damage to our bodies. In fact, there's a brand new study that explains how linoleic acid has been a major contributor to the skyrocketing rates of cold and cancer in young adults today. Now, that 2008 study about our fatty tissue composition shows us something pretty alarming. Since 1959, the amount of linoleic acid found in our fatty tissue has gone up 136%, from 9.6% of our fatty tissue all the way up to 21.5% of our fatty tissue. And keep in mind that this study was also done 17 years ago. So if that trend continued, our fatty tissue could actually be at about 25.4% linoleic acid, which to me, is pretty terrifying because this lines up incredibly well with our increase in consumption of ultra processed foods, our increase in obesity, and our increase in chronic illnesses. Now there is another problem because what else happens when you start to eat more processed foods? Well, by default, eating more processed foods means you're just gonna be eating less nutrient-dense whole foods, but 
What's the big problem with that though? Well, there are at least 22 different vitamins and minerals that support the energy production pathways in your cells and mitochondria. If you're not getting adequate amounts of these micronutrients, this is gonna directly impair your metabolism and slow it down. So back in the 1960s, we were eating more whole foods that contain high quantities of vitamins and minerals that also have low levels of linoleic acid. And all of this supports our mitochondria and our metabolisms. And then we made this switch to eating more ultra processed foods that have no nutritional value that are also prepared with seed oils which destroy our metabolisms. So there's this kind of weird double whammy effect that really started to tank our metabolic health and get us fat. But food is really only one part of the story. And what if I told you that even if we ate the same way that we did in 1960, our modern lifestyle is still gonna set us up for weight gain. It's not just what we're eating, it's what we're not doing that's making us fatter too. Now, it's pretty obvious that people in the 1960s moved more than we do today. It's honestly just kind of like saying water is wet, but it's true. There were less desk jobs, more people took public transportation, which requires more walking to and from bus stops and stations. There were less household appliances like washing machines and dishwashers. People used manual push mowers for their lawns. It was a very different world that we lived in. But with each passing day as a society, we're just moving less and less. So it's incredibly obvious that our physical activity has completely changed, but there's also something kind of weird about the people back in the 60s though, or Maybe we're just weird because almost no one exercised back then. And it's interesting because back in the 60s, obesity was only at 13% compared to 40% today, yet they didn't even understand the benefits of exercise, but they were still healthier and skinnier than we are today. So maybe there's actually a little bit more to the story then. Now, there's another thing that has completely destroyed our metabolisms over the last 65 years that no one really talks about. And this is one of the most underrated aspects of our meteoric weight gain over that time. And it has everything to do with light because your light environment can literally destroy your hormones. So it's estimated that we currently spend about 90 to 95% percent of our time indoors while in 1960 it was closer to 60 to 70 percent but it's kind of crazy that no one really considers this as a reason why we've accumulated all this excess fat because when you actually dig a little bit deeper and start connecting the dots it really starts to make sense and to help you better understand this let's take a look at some hormone imbalances like low vitamin d low testosterone elevated cortisol insulin resistance and leptin resistance first it's important to know that all of these are linked to obesity and fat accumulation, but they all have a unique relationship with different types of light wavelengths. For example, low vitamin D comes from lack of UVB light from the sun. Increased cortisol can occur from impaired circadian biology and poor sleep, which can be linked to too much artificial blue light, especially at night. Poor sleep and lack of red and near infrared light along with excess artificial blue light can negatively affect your insulin sensitivity and blood sugar. Leptin resistance is related to too much artificial blue light which disrupts your circadian rhythm. And then we have low testosterone. All of the above can actually decrease testosterone levels but then sunlight also increases testosterone. And this is why summertime testosterone levels are generally higher while they tend to be a little bit lower during the winter. Now this isn't all pseudoscience, it's real. Our light environments and the fact that we spend all day indoors and almost no time outside are completely destroying our metabolisms. I mean, there are literally hundreds, if not thousands of studies that have been done on various types of light and how they affect our metabolic health. And they're actually just a few searches away on Google. Now, if you don't believe me though, here's a wild study on how red light affects our body's ability to use glucose. So in this study from 2024, they discovered that only 15 minutes of red light exposure at a wavelength of 670 nanometers lowered peak blood sugar levels by 27.7% compared to the control group after having consumed 75 grams of glucose. Also, this study right here says that not getting enough vitamin D can actually be a big reason why people get obese in the first place. It actually suggests that without getting enough sunlight, especially UVB rays, the body's natural way of managing energy and fat storage kind of gets thrown off and this lack of vitamin D sets off this winter mode where your body just starts to store or more fat and can lead to obesity and other health issues like metabolic syndrome. But the cool part is, is that they say that fixing your vitamin D levels could help prevent or even reverse these problems. Now, if you like science back fat loss information like this, click the link below to join my newsletter where I can be your personal body transformation coach. And I'll send you weekly content on some of the best strategies to lose weight. And watch this video right here if you wanna know some of those exact strategies that have picked up over the last 15 years.